On June 3, 1991, Unzen Mountain violently erupts. At the time, little was known regarding the specifics of volcanic eruptions and how fast the resulting cloud of gas and lava can be, resulting in over 40 people losing their lives. Because it was one of the first opportunities in history to capture color footage of a large eruption up close, media companies stationed their staff near the volcano, ignoring warnings from officials. Most of the people who passed away in this disaster were employees of these media companies or firefighters who had been stationed there to protect these employees. This is the story of the Unzen Mountain Disaster. Unzen Mountain sits on the Shimabara Peninsula, located on the west side of Kyushu, Japan's southern island. In 1792, this mountain was the cause of the worst eruption in recorded Japanese history, an eruption so violent it changed the shape of the mountain itself and created tsunamis reaching the other side of the Ariake Sea, surrounding the peninsula. This eruption is said to have caused at least 15,000 casualties. After this major event, Mount Unzen had been relatively quiet for the past 200 years. But in the late 20th century, the volcano would awaken from its slumber. Beginning in 1989, frequent earthquakes would be observed in the area. They were initially originating in the Tachibana Bay, located to the west of the peninsula, but the epicenter of these earthquakes would gradually move inland, towards Mount Unzen. A professor of Kyushu University, Ota Kazuya, who specializes in geology and volcanic activity, had been warning authorities about a buildup of magma under the Tachibana Bay and a potential eruption of Mount Unzen for the past 20 years. Although he had been more or less ignored, the professor had kept watch on seismic activity in this area, and seeing the frequent earthquakes making their way to Mount Unzen, he was confident an eruption was imminent. Professor Ota would eventually play a critical role in saving the lives of many local citizens. Following the earthquakes, small eruptions of gas and ash were observed beginning in November of 1990, and gradually grew stronger over the following months. The locals were initially excited about the revival of Mount Unzen, hoping it would become something of a spectacle that would attract tourists to the peninsula. Indeed, the area saw a spike in visitors towards the end of 1990 and the first few weeks of 1991. However, beginning in February of 1991, there was a series of much larger eruptions, blanketing the area in volcanic ash, scaring away any curious tourists. These eruptions would grow increasingly powerful over the next several weeks, and starting in April, Mount Unzen would begin spitting out not only gas and ash, but also molten rock in the form of lava. This lava launched into the sky would turn into rock mid-air, and come back down to earth like meteors. Nearby residents were evacuated due to the danger of these falling rocks, and landslides caused by volcanic ash that had accumulated from the continuous eruptions. The volcano would continue to release lava, and by the second half of May, a lava dome was clearly visible from aerial footage. A lava dome is a lump of half-molten rock, which is created when lava with high viscosity is slowly released from a volcano. The lava on the surface of the dome hardens, which gives it the appearance of solid rock from afar. However, the inside is not totally solid, and when pressure builds up, the dome can collapse, causing a deadly flow of molten rock and gas, known as a pyroclastic flow. These pyroclastic flows can reach speeds of 300 km per hour and temperatures of over 1000 degrees Celsius, incinerating everything in its path, and impossible to escape. The Roman city of Pompeii, which was destroyed overnight by a volcanic eruption, is said to have been in the path of a large pyroclastic flow. On May 24, 1991, the first pyroclastic flow was observed on Mount Unzen. On May 29th, the first pyroclastic flow during nighttime was observed, a mesmerizing display of shining lava against the night sky. Each time the lava came within several hundred meters of nearby houses, Professor Ota warned that a large pyroclastic flow was imminent, so authorities agreed to expand the evacuation zone just in case. Although regular civilians had more or less evacuated the area by this time, there was still a relatively large number of people in and around the evacuation zone. Because this was one of the first opportunities to capture such an eruption in color film, 
it attracted many people from the media and academia. There were some volcanologists that flew into Japan from overseas just to witness this event. Camera crews had set up a platform on a hill with a good view of Mount Unzen, well inside of the evacuation zone. These crews would also venture closer to the volcano during daytime to capture footage of the lava and the damage the series of eruptions had caused up close. They would also break into houses to illegally use phone lines and electricity. The local police who were patrolling the area took notice of this and presented their findings during a press conference, causing public outroar towards the media. Professor Ota and authorities warned the media to leave, but they would not comply, claiming they had a right to be there and that the freedom of the press should be upheld. They would also point out that none of the eruptions or pyroclastic flows so far had reached the platform they had set up on the hill. On top of that, they had taxis on standby at the platform, 24-7, just in case something really did go wrong. According to them, there was nothing to worry about. Due to this presence of the media, firefighters and police had to be stationed inside of the evacuation zone as well, to be able to rescue the camera crews in case of emergency, and to prevent them from randomly barging into people's houses. After the pyroclastic flow on May 29th, Mount Unzen had a brief moment of tranquility. The area had been covered by thick clouds for the following days, making it difficult to visually confirm the state of the lava dome. The platform where camera crews had set up was also engulfed in clouds, with visibility of only a few hundred meters at most. On June 3rd, 4.08pm, the ground suddenly begins to tremble. The lava dome had collapsed and an avalanche of molten rock and gas was making its way down the mountain at blistering speed. Due to the cloud cover, the camera crews were oblivious to what was happening. They may have even been excited by the ground shaking, hoping they can capture some more eruption footage. By the time they saw the pyroclastic flow making its way directly towards their platform, it was too late. The time from when the lava appeared through the clouds to when the lava swallowed the men was literally several seconds at most. As previously mentioned, they had taxis on standby in case they needed to make a quick getaway, but most of them didn't even make it to the vehicles. Sadly, it appears the cameraman does not always survive. This pyroclastic flow was by far the largest so far, reaching over 4 kilometers from the volcano, destroying hundreds of nearby houses in the process. It came to a halt just 50 meters from the border of the evacuation zone set by Professor Ota. If he had not suggested expanding the zone, the death toll might have been much higher. When the dust settled, 43 casualties were counted. 16 members of the media. 3 foreign volcanologists. 14 policemen and firefighters. 4 taxi drivers, who were there on standby for the camera crews. And 6 other local residents with many more injured. Over the next several years, Mount Unzen would continue its activity, counting over 9,000 eruptions in total, damaging thousands of nearby houses. On July 3, 1996, exactly five years since the devastating pyroclastic flow, the volcano was claimed dormant, falling back into its slumber. In the aftermath, people understandably pointed the finger at the media and their camera crews, if they had complied with the evacuation, the lives of the firefighters, policemen, taxi drivers, and the lives of their own cameramen would have been saved. For a long time this incident would be the first thing that comes to mind when Japanese people think of volcanic disasters in the modern day and age. But in 2014, another volcano would erupt, claiming the lives of 63 people, which I also have a video on. I'll leave a link in the description below if you're interested. A big thank you to Korbachu and my other Patreons for supporting this channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. As always, thank you for watching until the end. Please like, subscribe, and turn on notifications so you don't miss the next video. I'll see you next time.